Okay, welcome to this week's lecture. It's, it's going to be short and sweet, hopefully. Um, hopefully I don't talk too much, but um, we're going to talk about cellular respiration and its importance in our cells and what exactly it does for us. And um, it's such a really important process because it allows us to take the energy that we consume, the energy that's found in our carbohydrates and our lipids and our proteins, and it allows us to convert it into a form that our cells can actually use to power functions. So we're going to break this process down um, into the major steps and talk about what we get from each of those steps. And then we're also going to talk about um, what are some other ways that we can get energy or energy is used when um, cellular respiration isn't going on. All right. So cellular respiration is a series of pathways that allow us to extract the energy from the bonds found in the molecules that we eat. So say we start with a carbohydrate and that carbohydrate is a polysaccharide. Our body through the process of digestion will turn that polysaccharide made of many sugars into a monosaccharide specifically glucose and that glucose molecule is the molecule that goes through cellular respiration and helps to power our cells um, this is a process that occurs in both consumers like animals, like you and me and your dogs, and producers such as plants. There's a common misconception um, that I battle every single year uh, is that photosynthesis is only plants and cellular respiration is only animals. Um, that is not true. Cellular respiration occurs in both plants and animals. Plants, just like us, have to be able to break down the energy that they're storing in the process of photosynthesis. Now, ultimately, cellular respiration allows us to take that glucose molecule and turn it in or use the energy within um, to create what's called an adenosine tri, and that tri is going to be very important, phosphate molecule. And this ATP is the energy currency of a cell. So this is how our cells are able to um, power a lot of their processes. This is the battery or the currency that our cells are using. Um, our cells can't store a lot of energy. Um, there's just, when you talk about surface area and volume of a cell, there's just not a lot of space there. Uh, and so what they do is they have these quote unquote rechargeable batteries where they can use energy and then store it back in and use energy and store it back in uh, like a rechargeable battery or like your cell phone. When your cell phone's plugged in, we're storing energy into it. When we take our cell phone off the charger and start using it, we're removing energy from it. Uh, we're not having to store a bunch of energy elsewhere. We're just able to continually recycle that energy. So ATP is the molecule that allows us to do that. Um, it, since it's rechargeable, it allows us to maintain those needs um, over and over and over again. So when you look at adenosine triphosphate, you have this adenosine molecule. And then you have, if you look, you have one, two, three phosphates. So one, two, three phosphates. So that is your tri and your triphosphate. ATP. So try. Okay. When we break down adenosine triphosphate, we are actually breaking the bonds in between the phosphates. And when we break those bonds, we're releasing energy. So there's energy stored in these bonds right here and stored right here. And when we break these bonds, we're releasing energy. So when we break it, we lose a phosphate. So let's say we're breaking specifically this bond right here. All right, so we've removed a phosphate, and that just leaves one, two. So when we do that, it gives us an ADP, where we have adenosine. Oops, that's an N-E. 
dye phosphate where that dye means two. So you see you got one, two. And when we break that bond, we are releasing energy and that energy is what powers a lot of our cellular processes. Now if I want to store energy, so we've got glucose coming in and I want to store the energy that's found in the bonds of glucose and create more ATP molecules, I'm going to simply add that phosphate back in and then I end up with three phosphates and I have a charged battery and I'm ready to go for our next cell process. I break that third phosphate off, release the energy from this bond right here, and now I'm ADP again. And it's just cycles all over and over again. It's the ATP to ADP, oops, that should be a D, P. cycle. So if I lose a phosphate, I release energy and I become ADP. If I add a phosphate, I store energy and become ATP. Now, this process is extremely important because this ATP molecule, it powers everything. It powers um, the sodium potassium pumps. It powers muscle contractions. It, I mean, it's powering the majority of the processes within your body. All right. So how do we get ATP? What is the process that allows us to get ATP? Well, there are several different processes. We're going to talk about cellular respiration. We're going to talk about fermentation. Um, we're going to talk about anaerobic respiration. Um, but the one that gives us the most ATP, so the most ATP is cellular respiration, right? So if I am, if I want the most bang for my buck, I want my system to go through cellular respiration. Cellular respiration requires, of course, our glucose molecule because that's where we're getting our energy from, the, molecule, the bonds in the glucose molecule. And it also um, requires oxygen, right? Um, now, you might have heard that, like, um, I think the classic phrase is mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. And because mitochondria is the location where cellular respiration occurs. But the true phrase that the two, true thing of the, bleh, excuse me, what is really happening in cellular respiration in mitochondrion is oxidative phosphorylation. Okay, so this oxygen is extremely important in cellular respiration because it's what ultimately is powering the production of ATP. As a result of our glucose and oxygen, as a waste product or a byproduct of the production of ATP, we have carbon dioxide and water. All right? This is going to be metabolic water. So this is wastewater. Um, a lot of the water that your body produces um, and excels through your breath and excels as sweat and gets rid of as urine is metabolic water. And then carbon dioxide, obviously, you exhale as well. Um, the three main steps of cellular respiration are glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain. Uh, they occur in two main locations. So glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm, all right? It does not require oxygen. It's what you call anaerobic. And then the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain both occur in the mitochondrion. So the mitochondrion is essential for cellular respiration. Um, you might have learned the, the citric acid cycle as the Krebs cycle. Um, the Krebs, the word, the name Krebs comes after the guy that discovered the cycle itself. His name was Hans Krebs, and he was a biochemist, and he figured out that the process is a cycle that re that's reoccurring over and over and over again. Okay, and then the electron transport chain, you might have seen abbreviated as the ETC. All right, um, 
The electron transport chain is the portion of cellular respiration that requires oxygen. Um, so it is the part, when we say that cellular respiration has to have oxygen in order to function, that's because of this electron transport chain. That's where the oxygen is ultimately needed. So what we'll do is we'll break down each stage um, independently and then we will review and talk about what happens when there is no oxygen present. All right, so glycolysis occurs in the cytoplasm. And what it's doing is it's actually breaking that glucose molecule that is the result of digestion into two pieces. So if you look at that gly right there, that means sugar or glucose, and then lice right there means to break. So the word itself literally tells you what's going on. We are breaking the sugar or we are breaking the glucose. Now glucose, if you remember, is C6H12O6. So we are breaking it into half into two molecules of a three carbon pyruvic acid. All right, and these three carbon pyruvic acids are important because they are the input for the next stage. So this is to the citric acid cycle. So we have to have this breaking into this division of your glucose in order to have what is needed to go on to the next stage of cellular respiration, the citric acid cycle. Now this process as a whole is an expensive process. It's not just something that happens in the cell without the expenditure of energy. It actually costs the cell two ATP. Now the process itself makes four ATP. So we have a net gain. So overall, we have two ATP. So one of the things that my husband tells me when it comes to farming, because we have this uh, cattle ranch that we live on and we work at, um, on day in and day out, is that you have to spend money to make money. And, and I am not the type of person that likes to spend a lot of money. I'm the type of person that if he let me, I would store all my cash in a, in a um, mattress. I don't like to take big risks when it comes to money. But sometimes you have to spend money to make money, right? And glycolysis is an example of that. It may be an expensive process, but overall, we are making some ATP, all right? So the results of glycolysis, as a reminder, we have glucose that is broken into two pyruvic acids or pyruvates right here, and they are going to the citric acid cycle. Now the citric acid cycle um, occurs into in the mitochondrion. So we are now in the mitochondrion. Um, now we will not actually move into the mitochondrion unless oxygen is present. Um, so if oxygen is present, we'll go ahead and move into the mitochondrion. Now we don't need the oxygen at this step. We are just moving in. It's kind of like uh, our green light that lets us know that, yeah, we're actually going into cellular respiration. So those pyruvic acids, those pyruvates that were made in the glycolysis, when oxygen is present, will transport into the mitochondrion. Um, in the mitochondrion, we're going to go through this cycle. Okay, and it's kind of an interesting cycle. It has a lot of intermediate reactions where this molecule gets turned into this molecule, just gets turned into this molecule. But what we need to know is that as a result of the citric acid cycle, carbon dioxide is produced. So when we talk about, um, where are we at? Here we go. When we talk about the model or the the molecular formula for cellular respiration and we talk about carbon dioxide being a waste this carbon dioxide is a waste product of the citric acid cycle all right so that is coming from the citric acid cycle my ipad doesn't want to keep up with me tonight 
All right, so this is once again an expensive process. It cost us two ATP. We make four ATP, so our net gain is two ATP. So sometimes we have to spend money to make money. All right, now, once we move, once we get done with the citric acid cycle, we're, we're making ATPs, and then we move into the electron transport chain. Now, the electron transport chain is really interesting because the process of glycolysis releases electrons. And the process of the citric acid cycle gives us electrons. Now these electrons that are made in all of these steps previous to the electron transport chain get moved to the mitochondrial membranes. So if you look at a mitochondrion, a picture of a mitochondrion, let me see if I can draw one here, they're bean shaped and inside the mitochondrion you have a double membrane. Right, so it's always kind of represented as a squiggly. And along this double membrane, you have the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain is literally just moving electrons from one side to the other side of this membrane. And when it moves those electrons from one side to the other side, it's changing the energy level of that electron and it is making it carry more electrons and then eventually we get to the end and we can use all of the energy that those electrons are carrying to create this ATP molecule. We can use all of that energy to move that ADP molecule and put that third phosphate in. Um, now, it kind of works like a bucket brigade. And if you remember a bucket brigade, or don't know what a bucket brigade is, in a bucket brigade, Let's say we have a fire right here. You see my lovely drawing skills. So we have a fire, right? And we don't want the fire, but so we want to put water on the fire. I want to put water on the fire. I should make that blue, right? Since it is, you know, supposed to be water on the fire, all right? But our water source is too far away from the fire. So what happens is person number one takes the water source and puts the water in their bucket. And then person number one will then turn around and put the water from their bucket into bucket number two. And the person at bucket number two will take the water from their bucket and put it to bucket number three, right? So what we're essentially doing is we're moving the water from bucket to bucket and until we can put out the fire. That is what's happening with the electron transport chain. Only we're not moving water, we are moving electrons from energy level to energy level. And as we move them from energy level to energy level, maybe I should redraw this like this. As we're moving from energy level to energy level, we're getting more and more energy. Right? And we can take that energy and make ADP into ATP by adding that phosphate. But there still has to be somewhere for that, that water to go, the, that electron to go. And that somewhere is our oxygen molecule. Oxygen is essentially the fire where the electron goes at the end. So when we talk about the electron transport chain being essential um, to ATP production. And when we talk about how we cannot get to the electron transport chain unless we have oxygen, the oxygen is important because it's receiving all those electrons. And the energy goes to our ATP. All right? So we produce a lot of ATP in the electron transport chain. Right? And we say approximately 34 because that kind of has to do with the citric acid cycle. It doesn't always give us an even um, for ATP. Sometimes it gives us, um, we go like a 
turn and a half around the citric acid cycle. So it's not like a complete turn. But approximately 34 ATP are the result of the electron transport chain because of the number of electrons that we receive from glycolysis in a citric acid cycle. So cellular respiration produces a lot of ATP because of the electron transport chain. Okay, what happens when there is no oxygen? And you think about situations when there is no oxygen, um, we can think about anaerobic bacteria um, or bacteria that live in areas where there is no oxygen present. Um, we can think about uh, when we talk about exercise. If your body is using high intensity, ooh, that is not a good color for this, high intensity, short time periods, um, we are requiring energy with not much time to get oxygen. I mean, you think about like if you're doing a, um, a squat, right? So you're lifting weights and you're doing a squat or you're doing a deadlift. You're requiring an instant amount of energy, but you don't have much time to breathe. You think of how long it takes for you to go down and then up. There's not time to do a lot of breathing. There's not time to bring in a lot of oxygen. So you're forcing your body to create energy in times when there's no oxygen. Um, you can think about sprinting versus long distance running. If we were to, to diagram this, right? So if we were to diagram this and we talked about time. So this would be like zero seconds. Time in seconds. Um, so like zero, five, ten, right? You get in a point. And we are talking about the amount of energy produced by cellular respiration. Um, and the amount of energy produced by anaerobic respiration as we start exercising the majority of our energy is coming from anaerobic respiration but as time goes on so let's say we go from zero to two minutes instead of from zero to 30 seconds you're going to see eventually Right? Most of our energy is going to be aerobic or cellular respiration. Most of our ATP is going to come from cellular respiration because you can draw a lot of breaths in two minutes and we can get a lot of oxygen input in two minutes. Okay? So when there is no oxygen, it is considered anaerobic. I cannot spell it. without oxygen. Now there's a lot of different ways. Um, there's a few different processes that uh, organisms can use to create energy without the presence of oxygen. Now they are not nearly as efficient as cellular respiration. You're not going to get 36 to 38 ATP from anaerobic respiration, but they do produce some ATP. Um, so an example is fermentation. So this is a, a process in which we can make ATP without oxygen. It's really only going to produce basically what glycolysis produces. So very little oxygen is produced there. So I think that's I believe that's two net um, oxygen. Sorry, two net ATP produced in fermentation. Now there's different types of fermentation. Lactic acid fermentation, if you are an athlete or you are an exercise nut, you've probably heard the term lactic acid. And essentially, lactic acid fermentation, we're creating ATP, we're charging those ATP molecules without energy. And what happens is your pyruvic acid, that is the result of glycolysis, gets converted to lactic acid. All right. And this is what burns. This lactic acid is what's causing your burn. Now, um, 
so used by animals uh, in your muscles you see lactic acid fermentation now this creates what's called an oxygen debt um, that oxygen debt when reversed will take lactic acid back to peruvic acid so the burning sensation um, like if you're doing a wall sit for a long period of time or you're using um, your muscles in in high intensity short bursts of exercise and you feel that burning sensation that's your lactic acid now lactic acid does not cause soreness soreness is a result of the micro tears within your muscles but it can be converted back to peruvic acid when that oxygen debt is cleared so as your body takes in oxygen after the exercise it will convert that lactic acid back to peruvic acid so that your body can use it so we see lactic acid fermentation in our muscles uh, we see it in yogurt production if you like to eat yogurt um, that is a result of lactic acid fermentation you can actually make your own yogurt using this process um, and red blood cells will use lactic, lactic acid fermentation now another type of fermentation that you may be familiar with is alcoholic fermentation and alcoholic fermentation is generally done by those little yeast beasts so what they're doing is they're taking the sugars and converting it into a waste product now if that waste product is in liquid form it is considered ethanol so if you're taking like um, grains and you're turning them into beer that is alcoholic fermentation so we are taking the sugars in those grains and converting them into ethanol now if you like bread you like yeast breads you're using alcoholic fermentation to cause that bread to rise so one of the things that my daughter loves to eat is cinnamon rolls so when I make cinnamon rolls I take the yeast and I feed it sugar in a warm wet environment and those yeast gobble it up and as a result they're producing a gas and that gas causes my dough to rise and makes those big fluffy cinnamon rolls that my daughter loves so you've probably come in contact with fermentation many many times within your life you just never really thought of what's going on and what is it the result of and what's driving this process so what essentially is going on in these processes is we are creating energy we are charging those ATP molecules in the absence of oxygen all right so to wrap things all up this is a diagram of cellular respiration all right. it occurs in the cytoplasm cytoplasm and also in the mitochondria right. we start um, with glucose in the process of glycolysis and we create pyruvate total two ATP are charged so two ADP molecules get phosphates added to them and we create those ATP molecules now those pyruvates will move into the mitochondria and ultimately they're going to end up at the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle is going to give us two ATP and carbon dioxide as a waste product. All right? So if you notice in this diagram, it's showing you electrons moving over and electrons moving over. So after our citric acid cycle, we have enough electrons that we can go through oxidative phosphorylation in the electron transport chain. And we are using oxygen as a receiver and we are creating 34 ATP molecules. So cellular respiration is an extremely important process. It allows us to take the molecules that we consume and digest and convert them into a form that our bodies can use. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to email me um, or contact me. I am happy to help at any time. Enjoy.